Awesome. Thank you so much, Christina. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be with you all today. It's super exciting to be a part of the Linux Foundation live webinars. And, um, you know, one of the nice things about live webinars is that we get to interact with each other. So please feel free to ask me any questions, chat any, uh, chat with me. Um, I have it all up and I'll be able to answer questions during the presentation as well. So feel free to ask anything, make any comments that you'd like to make. I know that this session is uh, a more interesting one because uh, I think a lot of people already inherently know about how governance works, right? We know about government systems, we know about how rules work, how standards are. And, and so applying it to uh, IT and to our software services is really interesting because suddenly now we're thinking about it from the perspective of, well, how do I govern my software deliverables? And how do I do it through this automated process? And so that's why I, I'm going to really enjoy the session because we're really going to be talking about how to apply governance to CICD. And a little bit more about me, I am a technical evangelist at Harness, and we help people with simplify and scale their CI, CD, and their software delivery. So if you have any questions about this presentation, just feel free to ask. Um, I really do enjoy these kinds of presentations. And I, I want to start this presentation by kind of going over some of the reasoning and history behind why we may even decide to care about governance, uh, particularly in the space of, of software. So in 2020, there was actually the solar winds hack. And a lot of people, I think, were uh, surprised, but also kind of reflective, um, especially in the CI/CD space. We, we were thinking about, well, why did something like this happen and why did it affect so many people? So in 2020, December 2020, a cybersecurity firm uh, called FireEye, who was a customer of SolarWinds, uh, an organization that provides IT monitoring solutions, noticed that some of their cybersecurity uh, software was being used outside of their company. And when they looked into it, they had noticed that there was actually a supply chain hack that had occurred where SolarWinds had shipped out malicious code uh, within their software ser uh, services to over 18,000 SolarWinds customers. And it actually impacted big organizations like the Department of Homeland Security, NASA, Microsoft. And it made people, even today, just reconsider like, what it what are they using to deliver their software services and how can they better avoid supply chain hacks and malicious uh, targeters and malicious hackers uh, throughout their processes so actually I, I think in a lot of ways we we know the inherent risk of software failures right things like this that um, have, impacts, it may have an initial small impact on a, a, a group of people, but then have this like chain, daisy chain effect uh, that inevitably impacts more and more people, right? Um, the fact that solar winds was compromised may not have been a big deal, but now the fact that they had, comp they had caused a compromise to Microsoft or the Department of Homeland Security is a bigger deal. And so in 2017, they looked at over 600 software failures and noticed that it was due to a misconfiguration uh, set up in, in their environment. And that actually resulted in 3.6 billion people being affected and a, lo a financial loss for the organizations of over $1.7 trillion. And uh, in, in newer studies today, we're seeing that the cost of correcting software failures is actually fairly expensive. So it's on average $4 million to create, correct things like a data breach that's already happened to customers. And I think this is really interesting because we know this, like we know that this is what happens when we have issues that get found after we've delivered uh, a piece of code or we delivered a change, a software service change, right? We, we know that uh, to be able to say like, oh crap, we made a mistake. We, we need to take that back. That actually costs a lot more than when we're actually coding uh, or designing or thinking about 
uh, the requirements that we need to gather and the architecture and fixing those mistakes earlier on and catching those big security vulnerability, potential security vulnerabilities early on than further down in the process, right? And I, I think we've understood this for a few decades now, right? With the emergence of agile development processes and now DevOps principles and practices and tooling and automation. And I think this is a good segue into why we might want to automate governance for our services, for our software services, right? And, and so that's why I want to talk about automated pipeline governance, or in other words, CI CD governance today. And CI CD governance is how organizations attest to the integrity of assets in a delivery pipeline. So it's everything that's related to your delivery pipeline, right? It's the infrastructure that you use, the, that you provision. It's the different environments that you decide to have. It's that change control board that you may have. It's the people who have access to your control, uh, your delivery pipeline. And then it's also inevitably those software services that go through your de delivery pipeline, right? That code that gets, uh, that gets tested, that gets verified, that gets packaged up and, and put onto the server where it's running now. And now it's open for all of our customers. So in this session, I wanna go over some more definitions about software delivery in general and kind of give you a better sense of what is uh, what is uh, CI/CD, and how can I succeed in, uh, with CI/CD? And then I want to go over some of the principles of governance, uh, and then that's how we can finally get to this uh, final part of the presentation, where we can talk about practices and tooling and how to integrate that into our CI/CD pipelines. Because uh, it's only when we can kind of understand the foundations first that we can start building up pipelines that are that automate our, our governance and, and our standards and the things that we want to be able to accomplish or set for our uh, for our organizations and when it, as it relates to delivering software. So I want to start with continuous integration and continuous delivery. If anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to uh, answer them in the chat uh, as well. So feel free to stop me if I'm uh, if I say something that doesn't make sense. Um, but I, I do wanna cover uh, some components of continuous integration and continuous delivery now. So uh, CI/CD um, in, in the sense is just uh, a way of automating the process from getting from idea to production. So it's, it's when we have this idea to serve a customer to serve, to have you know some software service do some some type of thing that we decide well okay we want to release it out to a customer and so that process from idea to production can look like a, a, a couple of different things right in the most basic uh, sense we would we would want to uh, package that software up, right? We would wanna test it, make sure that there's a certain level of quality, right? Especially if we're gonna put our names on it. And then that's when, after we've tested it, we kind of have a good idea that it works, then we can actually deploy it and release it out to our customers. And so a CI CD pipeline just uh, automates that process. It automates the process that we have um, uh, for our software development lifecycle. And this process can continue again, right? We can deploy something into production and say, well, wow, that did a really awesome job. Now we have new requirements. We have new features. We want to expand this or, you know, we want to have this new feature that does X, Y, Z with for our customers. And so you can repeat that process again and deploy it again and again. And the idea is that we can do this repeatedly and much faster uh, and, and even with more sustainability uh, than if we were to do this manually with our people or if someone had to do these things, uh, if like one person was in charge of doing all of these things manually without a CI CD pipeline or without any automation. And so that's what CI CD is, right? And a lot of times people will kind of combine CI CD uh, into uh, this kind of one term that talks about how we get from uh, different parts uh, of this cycle, right? Maybe it's build to deploy uh, for some people and for some other people it's to get from, uh, you know, build to test. And so it can mean a lot of different things, I think sometimes, and that's where some confusion can come into play. So I do want to cover uh, about, cover some of the 
differences between continuous integration and continuous delivery, because you can't have one without the other and expect to be able to deliver software on a repeatable, sustainable, and, and quick process, right? So in continuous integration, we're really thinking about our development workflows. So it's when we have already com uh, worked on our code, we commit it, right? And now we just want to package it up in some way. And so when we package it up, we'll actually build into the package, the dependencies, the different libraries that we may be using, right? If we're leveraging some type of framework or some type of runtime, you know, that, that runtime will get compiled or interpreted. And then you'll be able to version that, right? Say like, mm, okay, that worked. Uh, everything works. You know, there's no compilation errors. Uh, well, now we can, we can say, well, this could be a release candidate or this could be our alpha or our beta, right? And so you can tag it, you can store it, you can think about it, you can do other things to it. But essentially, you're integrating pieces of code into this artifact that's ready to be deployed and run on a computer or some type of infrastructure. And that's where continuous delivery picks up, right? We have this artifact that's ready to be put on a server. Um, and so continuous delivery will actually say, well, what environments are we going to deploy to? What infrastructure are we going to deploy to? Is this going to go to AWS, uh, a server uh, EC2 instance on AWS? Is it going to go on Kubernetes? Is it going to go on, you know, what, what kind of environment is it going to go on? And one of the nice things is that we can actually automate this process. You know, we can spin up new environments and just deploy on demand. And uh, so a, a good part of continuous delivery is about ensuring that we have the right environments and that we can get this artifact into those environments and, and that we can manage this change, understand it, right? Uh, and then employ some deployment strategies. So figuring out, well, what kind of release strategy do I wanna have if it has a big impact, if this feature change has a big impact, you know, maybe I only want to release it to 10% of my customers first, just in case there is some type of uh, danger or risk associated with delivering a, a big change. Or maybe I want to introduce verification methods, right? Once I've deployed an application service, I want to make sure that I'm logging specific events. Um, I can detect errors if there are errors and then roll back if there are any incidents, you know, just undo the deployment and go back to either go back to a new, uh, to a working state or even just roll forward and, and fix that mistake and then put it out for our customers quickly, right? And so there's kind of a foolproof method here that goes to say, that, that says like, okay, even if we make a mistake, there's, there's some way that we can remedy it or there's some way that we can minimize it. And that's what continuous delivery is about. And, and so today we're also seeing like, there's a lot more of an ecosystem around supporting this, right? Um, especially as it pertains to leveraging solutions like infrastructure as code to uh, provision quickly, Vault, uh, KMS, CyberArk to protect our secrets. Um, also like even just general metrics, like DevOps metrics and understanding uh, for CICD that allow us to continuously improve and track like how are we doing in our CD process and our CICD process and then there's even things like well pipeline management how who has access to particular environments who has uh, access to particular pipelines that deploy to particular environments right uh, maybe it doesn't maybe you know the new person joining doesn't need to have access to that on their first day um, or or maybe certain teams don't need to have access to other teams uh, resources. And so it, it's just something all to think about here um, that in, in the world of software delivery, there's actually already a lot going on, right? And so if we can build into uh, our, our foundation of CI, CD, then we can actually achieve governance in a better way. And so now that we understand more about CI, CD, I wanna actually talk about governance and what it means uh, because I, I think when we talk about IT governance specifically, it's slightly different and it, it may encompass more than a typical conversation about governance or a typical conversation around standards. And I really think of it as kind of three areas that we think about when we think about IT governance. We're thinking about standards, we're thinking about security, and then we're also thinking about audits. So um, there's this umbrella term for govern IT governance that covers three three of these areas, and it's called GRC, Governance, Risk, and Compliance, 
And so when we talk about governance, or that's where we're talking about our standards, right? So uh, just like we would set standards for a state of emergency uh, in, in the US, right? Uh, what happens when there is a earthquake or what happens when there is a hurricane, right? Certain spe specific, specific groups of people are set up, specific camps are set up, you know, some people show up, we have these things that are set in place, notifications are sent out. And so that's what governance is in a nutshell, right? We're, set, we're kind of preparing and setting up systems for people to be able to expect the unexpected. Um, and then also setting up like the, the communication channels to deal with that. And so, Governance is about setting these standards for what we want to do when we don't know what to do or when we can't predict the unpredictable. And so uh, the reason why we do that is so that we can oversee uh, specific goals, achieve certain specific goals, and also maintain everything that we have uh, in, uh, with going on in our organizations. So, you know, things like the solar winds hack happening to solar winds, that's that's a really big hit, right? So what, what communication channels did they have uh, when they found out? You know, what were the different systems that they had to be able to look more deeply into the, these, uh, the situation? That's what governance is trying to uh, discover. And then we're, we, I wanna cover risk. The second part around risk is about security. Right. So being able to identify potential risky behavior uh, when we're de delivering software. You know what is, you know, like what happened in solar winds was that there was uh, some people made mistakes. Right. And that could be a certain level that could introduce a certain level of risk to your organization. And so GRC, the risk part of GRC is about rating and prioritizing risks and ensuring that people are aware of them, right? So that we can mitigate them in the future so that we do have systems in place to say like, um, hey, our systems are not up to date or, hey, we have some configuration uh, drift going on in our infrastructure. This is how we, this is the actions that we need to take. So risk is really this uh, kind of action plan around how we identify, uh, uh, how we can potentially secure, better secure our systems. And then compliance. I think people understand compliance pretty well uh, because it's similar to how we work in the real world, right? Uh, our healthcare uh, entities, our, um, our standards for medication or practices uh, is what compliance means, right? There's a certain level of expectations around vaccines, a certain level of expectations around how drugs should work or how they should be taken, right? And so the drug manufacturers or vaccine manufacturers have to comply with those standards if there are standards, right? And so compliance is about meeting expectations and being able to prove that you meet those expectations uh, because it's a science, right? Um, we don't want someone to just say like, hand wavy, yeah, it works, you know, this vaccine is gonna cure everybody when it doesn't. And we need to know the percentage of effectiveness. And so that means being able to document and log exactly how things were built, when were they built, why were they built, what are the features, what's going on into, what's going on with our software services. And even being able to do it to the extent of foolproofing any expectations that we may have in the future. So as more current events happen, as we change how we think about practices, our expectations are going to change as well. Um, COVID changed how we, uh, how we perceive vaccines and our expectations around how, uh, how successful and how, uh, how they perform work. And so maybe the, compli the compliance levels and uh, how, we, how we deal with even data or personal information, those things will change. And so we need to be able to improve, continuously improve, and also have the systems to be foolproof in the future. And so this is GRC and IT governance. And it's really about how you monitor and control your IT capabilities and decisions when you're going to deliver. And when we talk about DevOps, when we talk about delivering software, we're really talk talking about delivering value to key stakeholders, right? To our customers, to the, uh, to the target audience of our software services. And so there's two parts here that I want to break down further, right? Uh, this concept of being able to monitor 
and this concept around being able to control because we need both of these things, right? We need to be able to control uh, a certain level of uh, risk. We need to be able to monitor a certain level of risk. Same thing with compliance, right? We need to build these into our CI CD systems. And so this is the last part of the presentation that I wanna cover. And it goes into details about how you can build particular yeah, so we had a question uh, about do we get the slides, um, but I'll, 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 I have a copy of them, so I can, I can send that out as well. Yeah, that's super awesome. Um, and, and again, yeah, like, you're not going to be able to introduce all of these changes all at once, right? And it'll go back to saying like, well, what can we change? Or what, what areas do we want to change? Right? And so it'll be, um, It'll be interesting to go over some of these um, practices and do them in a way where it makes sense for you and your part of the software development lifecycle. Again, like delivering software is not just one person's responsibility. Security, uh, code quality, performance, that's not just one person's responsibility, right? These are cross-functional teams. These are different groups of people who are working together to deliver something really awesome. And so uh, you may take some of these practices with a grain of salt saying like, hey, I, I have nothing to do with the system or uh, I'm not the person who makes decisions, but I do make decisions in how we de develop code, how we do it with uh, secure practices. So this is, these are the steps I'm gonna take to do that. Uh, and so that's why I broke this down in, in different parts of the software development life cycle um, so that you can kind of pick and choose where, where you can make that change and where you can make impact. So this is the build phase. And in the build phase, this is earlier on, right? This is when you have a feature developed and now you, you're just ready to go forward, right? You're, it's the end of the sprint. You wanna integrate it to the rest of the code base. Potentially it could, this could be released. This could be a release candidate. This could be you know, the change that's gonna go out to customers. Um, it could not be, it could just be one step towards that, right? Whatever it may happen to be in this build phase that we trigger. Uh, we, we have some code and we're ready to go. And so what can you do in this process? There's a couple of things that I really recommend. The first one is just st static code analysis. So this is a screenshot of something called Sonar Cube. They have an open source version, I'm pretty sure as well. Uh, and what happens is these tools will look at uh, your code, your source code, and uh, and analyze it for things like potential vulnerabilities. So if you're doing things like um, hard coding any sensitive information or infrastructure inf information into your application code, if you are potentially using secrets and it like doesn't look right um, in terms of how you're using the libraries or any of your dependencies, uh, it'll actually tell you and flag those and actually gives you a grade too. So and here, like you pass the quality gates, but you have 11 vulnerabilities and you, you got a score of a D and then you have some bugs and they rated a C. So you can kind of look at that. They also give you things like uh, code smells. So potentially like some uh, inclinations that your code may not be um, as robust or as elegant as you may want it to be. And these are really great because it doesn't only look at your code that you wrote, but also like other people's code, the entire source code, uh, the code base, the entire code base itself. Um, and some other things that people will do in the build phase will also be doing things like scanning for secrets. So, you know, your, your secrets lie in various places of your application code. So a nice thing to do is also like run uh, run scanners on the par packaged artifact that you have and be able to detect like, do we have vulnerabilities or not? And the reason why you wanna do this is um, not only because you, you may not trust your code or someone else, it's, it's not really about that, right? It's not really about that you don't trust the code that you write or you don't trust your team, but it's, it's a sense that, um, we use more than just the code that we write. And so there was actually a study that looked at the most popular applications in the enterprise market today, you know, the code that you use every day. And they actually noticed that 96% um, of the most popular applications currently use open source software. Um, and there was another study that said 
um, and this was all written in the article. And so in the same article, they said that there was more than 4,000 security vulnerabilities uh, discovered in, op in open source projects a year. And so that dependency that you may be using or that new runtime of Python may actually be uh, compromised. And so when we build our systems to be able to detect these kinds of mistakes ahead of time, then we don't have to worry if, um, then we don't have to worry as much about, well, um, you know, what happens if uh, there is a security vulnerability that happens like, uh, like it did in the solar winds hack? No question here. In what phase of the development cycle do you monitor and control? I was thinking it would be done after releasing the software. Yeah, so you definitely monitor and control um, your applications after you deploy, right? Uh, after you've done a production release, people will, you know, monitor how the application is working, maybe for the next 24 hours, you know, if there are any major incidents, people will be on call and that kind of thing. But I think it's really important to build some of those checks earlier on, right? So like that sonar, sonar cube uh, program was the one that checks for vulnerabilities. That was another question. Um, you know, being able to have just something as simple as a scan and, and like it, sometimes it only takes like, a, like two minutes to scan, right? And be able to detect, hey, there's a, there's a vulnerability or be able to monitor potential issues. Right and control them, um, and I kind of think of governance as a set of controls at the end of the day, at least CI/CD governance, because imagine having a CI pipeline with no tests. There's no way that you know that what you integrated works aside from the fact that it compiles, right? And so a form a, a form of control can also be quality gates. And I'll actually talk about that a little bit more because there are a couple organizations that are doing automated CI CD governance and they kind of listed out like how they set monitoring and controlling capabilities in their CI CD pipelines. So that's a really great question. Thanks everyone. So um, where was I? Yes, so there, there are issues uh, in, in codes, uh, there's vulnerabilities in code and they can pretty much happen everywhere, um, even if it's not your code. And so that was kind of the case for Microsoft, right? This was actually a blog post they had written after they noticed, uh, after the SolarWinds uh, hack had been announced and they were investigating it. So they actually wrote a blog post trying to figure out, well, what exactly happened and why were they compromised? Just because they were the ones that had used Solar winds, and they had to look. Um, you know, they had to comply and say, like, "Hey, you know, we need to figure out who else was impacted because we were impacted." And again, it was this daisy chain, right, effect. And so, actually, uh, you know, I don't have to pay too much mind to this screen cap, but I'll, because I'll review it. But essentially, what happened was there was a library DLL component within Solar Winds that was uh, that was hacked because uh, that code base was in a GitHub repository that had an exposed secret. And so what happened was a attacker injected code into that library and that library, uh, when it ran, executed, it would actually initiate a backdoor server that would send any information that was going through SolarWinds to that backdoor service. And so I actually have a screenshot of what um, Microsoft investigated and noticed was that in the original function, there was actually an injected function here that started up a server, right? And the, this was the back door that any, any information that went through, it would send it over. So this is what happened um, in the solar wind hack. And I think a lot of different, uh, a lot of different software services and just organizations that were a part of this process, the process for delivering software were implicated. For example, uh, SolarWinds was using a CI tool called Team City. And so now the government doesn't wanna use Team City, doesn't wanna use um, JetBrains or um, IntelliJ's 
I think it's JetBrains. Yeah, JetBrains product anymore because it led to a vulnerability, right? I'm not sure what Solar Solar Winds. This one is Java. So uh, we had a question that asked uh, if Solar Winds was built on Python. Uh, this one's Java. Great question. So you know, this this just kind of goes to say like. You know, you're even though the CI, the Team City, there is, you know, there is no compromise in Team City. It still led to a compromise, right? It still built that code base and shipped it out. And so, at any kind of process, at any point in our delivery process, we can get, we can get um, our secrets, our, our important information compromised. And so it can be as simple as a plain text password in a GitHub repository or a Bitbucket repository, or it can be a CI server that's using a app, uh, a secret, but it's not encrypted. It's just plain text secret. Could also be artifact repository or even an orchestrator that's using plain text. They can, they can look into they can hack a particular uh, node in a particular environment, right? And get a gain access to your application. And so there's application secrets that live everywhere and we need to be able to acknowledge that and be foolproof to even just simple mistakes as leaving things in plain text. Oops. So one thing that I recommend uh, for people who have CI CD pipelines who are creating resources, creating different resources for their application teams to be able to deliver is just to introduce something as simple as role-based access control, right? This can be based on user groups, right? It can be based off of um, your organizational layout, right? What team you're under. And then you can apply it to different parts of your software delivery process. So you can apply it to particular environments you can apply it for particular types of deployments. You know, you can say like, hey, team A doesn't need to have permissions to control, create, update anything related to team B's applications. They shouldn't even be able to execute a pipeline or half of a pipeline for another team's applications, right? So you need to be able to, to do that as well. And that's actually something that SolarWinds did not do well. And I, I think you can tell based off of some of the reports and them just trying to investigate like what happened, <laughs> you know? And, and at one point, I think they tried to blame an intern saying like, yeah, this person, it's like, uh, and, and I think one of the actions that they took earlier on was just also, uh, they said they had released a report saying like, yeah, we, we took action and now we're limiting who has access to all of these resources. And I mean, they should have done that earlier, right? And so that's something to note, is just that you have different resources, you have different things like uh, different, um, even just views, like an admin view, a billing view, a security view, maybe no, maybe only one or two people need access to that, not the whole organization. So this is, this is about role-based access control for our software delivery pipeline. All right, so I want to get to this test phase. Um, we mentioned earlier about quality gates um, and, and even thinking about it from the perspective of, okay, well, our application code, like we, we've run unit tests now, we know that functions work as expected, you know, have some type of performance, meet some type of performance criteria, et cetera, et cetera. Well, how do they work with other services if they're in a microservices architecture or if they're in a coupled architecture, how do they work? And so there's a couple of different ways that you can test, right? You can test white box from the white box or black box. So in black box testing, you, know, you don't really, you, you write the tests with the assumption that you don't know what the implementations are, right? You don't know what language it's coded and you just, you just create those unit tests. In white box testing, you want to ensure that like certain particular major parts of um, the code base or particular parts of the code base are tested. 
right? That we 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 know that this works without a beyond a doubt. And that's important, right? If you're going to reuse a particular part of code, or if you're, you want to make sure that uh, one part of code never changes, then white box, white box unit testing can be really helpful. And then automating this process is also a really big thing, right? So creating test suites, ensuring that we have code coverage. I've seen so many times when people have a pipeline, uh, a build pipeline, uh, and they don't keep up with the unit tests. So after a while, they just turn off unit tests and they have the CI pipeline that doesn't have any tests. And it's like, how do you, how do you know that it actually works? Do you know that it actually works? You don't want to wait until you find out, oh, a customer finds out, right? So this is one good example of how people will ensure that they have governance. So let's say like, okay, one of my controls is this uh, set of unit tests. And so my attestation or the fact that I know that this works, which is what I need to say in governance, right? Is that uh, I know I succeed my CI pipeline when all tests have been executed and they pass. It doesn't make sense for you to have a CI CD pipeline and just say, well, you know, uh, half of our tests pass. So we're just gonna go and deploy, right? What kinds of standards are you trying to meet? Um, and so if, if it is like, if, if that is how you want to govern your uh, software services and you say like, oh, only 50% have to pass. Um, okay, that's what your association is. But again, like we need to be able to say some of these things ahead of time, right? Um, another one is just clean dependencies, right? An association might be all dependencies in this build are free of known security defects. So we run our tests, you know, if it works or not. So these are just examples of ways that you can set controls and then monitor, hey, do I have this working or not? You know, and, and so our CI pipeline can be our monitor. You know, our dashboard that says pass or fail, CI pipeline pass or fail, that's how we know. And then it has a little report that says all tests executed and passed, right? Our, our unit test suites that we have, JUnit 5, um, I'm not sure what it is in Python, but right, we have, we have, unit, we have unit test suites that say like, yeah, all tests pass. That, that's an association. That's a way of monitoring. Do I have, did I achieve the result that I wanted to result to achieve? Did I, did I achieve the results that I wanted, right? All right, so I think this is the last part. Yes, this is the last part, last kind of section for practices that you can use to employ governance. And this is in the deployment phase. So we mentioned uh, earlier, like, you know, we have this artifact that we're going to deploy into a service, right? Or uh, we're going to deploy into a server. Now we have to provision, configure, and then deliver it, right? So there's a couple of practices that you want to have here. Uh, the first thing is around being able to verify and test your configurations work as, as they should. So you need to be able to document and figure out, well, is this particular server configured with things that I need to configure it with? You know, if it's running Nginx, is that configured? What is the password that you're using, right? If it's admin123, it may be a security vulnerability. And then doing things for your application itself. So there's kind of twofold, looking at your infrastructure and then looking at your actual applications. So doing things like penetration testing, system tests, vulnerability scanning while it's running. Yeah, on which platform will you deploy? right? There are different ways to test your configurations for different platforms, for different cloud providers. Uh, we have a question here. Suppose we have an internal gateway which inspects inbound and outbound traffic. If we already deployed such production, do we need extra CI CD production despite static code analysis and tests? If we have, yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, I think it depends on your uh, actual software service, right? Because if yours is not uh, running, it's not like a service that other people consume um, uh, as like a UI or something that's running, right? If it's like an API, Let's get, that gets compromised because you don't have um, static code analysis or tests built in, or you know it gets 
malicious code injected and you wouldn't be able to find out through your CI CD pipeline, that could be a really big issue. I think it really depends on your software service. I think it's good to have, uh, again, it's like the sense of governance, like it's good to have uh, some means and some practices or at least some like toolkits in your toolbox, right? To be able to say like, well, you know, now we have this very successful application. You know, there's another team that we're going to spin up or there's another service that we're going to spin up that offers something else, right? And so the use case is different and the way that people consume it is different. And so now um, the standards that we want to have may be different. So there's something to note there. Really awesome question. It's a top down, it's a top management responsibility of the organization for sustainable development. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I definitely think that, um, I mean, we say it in DevOps all the time. It's just like, we need great DevOps leadership. We need people who, leadership, who will say, yes, we will support this. We'll give you the tools that you need. We'll give you the training to use those tools, right? It's people process technology. It doesn't work when it's just developers saying it, you know? Yes, we want to have bottom up, but we also want to have top down. Got an anonymous question on, will you use all kinds of orchestrators? Um, it's a little bit of a uh, confusing question. Um, yeah, you can use different kinds of CI CD tools. You can use different kinds of ecosystems, right? Different sets of tools. I'm giving really general practices and tooling that you can use, doesn't matter what runtime you have, doesn't matter what um, platforms you're using. So I hope that helps. We had kind of like two questions uh, around platforms and orchestrators. So I hope that answers both of them. Thanks for the questions. Sweet. Um, one other thing that's not exactly built into our CI CD pipelines, but can be related to our CI CD pipelines is just this idea of being able to review, annually review during this process, or in particular parts of our process, um, exactly what we're trying to deploy, what, where, when, and why. And CI CD can actually help with this process, right? Because our CI CD uh, pipelines are taking our code from uh, throughout all these processes, right? From build to test, to deploy, to verify, and then to roll back if we need it. And so you can actually have a group of people that you really trust and they understand like all of the rules, they understand how the application serv or service works. And this can be a group of, you know, architects can be, uh, that also includes the product owner, you know. And what happens is during that CI CD process, you know, when you're filling out a JIRA ticket or saying like, hey, this, um, this deployment to, a non-production environment worked? Can we review it for a production deployment? That's what a change control board can actually do. And so having a change control board probably could have helped the solar winds, um, pre help prevent the solar winds hack, right? If they had a control board, um, a change advisory board that could see uh, how certain pieces of code had changed, even if they had done a code review or just like looked into the source code, what, what exactly was built in, they'd be able to stop that. They'd be able to say, hey, this, is, this looks weird. That injected code, that looks weird. That's not part of something that we developed. That's not a change that we had planned to make, right? And so at, at kind of like any point of the software development lifecycle, they could just say like, nope, we're not gonna, we're gonna re-review that before we deploy, or I'm just gonna, we're not gonna do this deployment, this deployment fails. So being able to say at any point, like to control your CI CD pipeline, say like, no, we choose when this deploy, when this goes out, right? It's really big. Most, most organizations don't employ continuous deployment. Continuous deployment is when you commit code and it goes straight to production, it goes straight to your customer. Most organizations don't do that. They don't need to do that. They don't even want to do that. They want to pick how often do they release? Is it weekly? Is it monthly? They want to be able to do it on demand. And that's what continuous delivery um, helps us to do. All right, this is a screenshot of the Harness platform because I think it's really important to be able to detect things that happen to our deploy configuration changes that happen for both our deployments and for our infrastructure. I mentioned earlier, like it's super important to be able to say like, hey, what, what, 
you know, what version of the service is this infrastructure running? You know, what version of Apache, what version of Nginx, you know, what version of Jenkins is it running? You'll be able to track that, right? Uh, we need to be able to do that with our service deployments as well. You know, when we're scripting Jenkins pipelines or we're scripting our CI CD pipelines, we need to be able to see like what, what happened. We need to be able to tell like if something changes, right? And so being able to see this at a high level and being able to say like, hey, um, this deployment looked really weird and then be able to go to that deployment and compare it to a previous deployment and see what the change was, is, is really important, right? You can be able to say like, oh, well, crap. Maybe the reason why we were not work, uh, we're not, uh, you know, there's a failure in our latest deployment is because we deleted our configuration variables. And so we're not actually passing in encrypted uh, our encrypted secret for our database. All right, I'm running out of time. So I am going to speed through the last few slides here. Um, same thing with audit trails, right? Being able to say who, what, when, where, why, uh, and, and what's happening within our software delivery processes. This is the harness audit trail, which takes, um, this is a screenshot of like different things that had happened in the platform. So I created, uh, if you look at the bottom, I created an artifact stream. I del Someone else deleted it. I updated a serverless specification. I updated the workflow and I know who did it, right? I know when they did it. I know what IP address they came from. And they, I know what services were impacted. That's really important. And so doing things like this will give you a better sense of like who deployed when, where, why, when, um, when, where, why, losing my mind, <laughs> um, to our environments. And we need to be able to do that especially if we're gonna say like hey we're compliant or maybe we do audits at the end of every year some organize some industries have to do that they have to say like what changes they made and so being able to do that or have a record of that is really important as well and that's what we're going to see in the future is just more deliberation and, and more intention towards what we deliver and why we deliver it and when we deliver it um, and so I want to close off by just sh sharing like where you can find governance in the wild, because this is pretty, pretty interesting, right? We have two minutes left, so I'll try to try to get this <laughs> done. But Capital One actually shared in a reference architecture white paper on um, automated pipeline governance. That's what it's called. It's by IT Revolution, the same company that gave you the DevOps handbook and Accelerate. Um, there's a there's a white paper that John Willis helped co-author. And they there were a bunch of other organizations that had contributed, but they shared um, one way that they were employing governance and they called it 16 gates. And this was the this was the way, this was how they were introducing this. And you know, they they have a bunch of practices here that we mentioned, but I really picked out the ones that made sense for anyone to be able to use, right? So things like source code version control, static code analysis, vulnerability scanning, penetration testing that I mentioned, integration testing, even they were doing more um interesting things around controlling who got to see specific features with feature toggling or feature flag management. That's also another great thing to employ, right? And I think a lot of people, a lot of harness customers are actually doing this today as well, which is what I wanted to mention that it does exist. People are doing automated pipeline governance, even though it may sometimes feel like this um, uh, crazy thing when we're still trying to figure out how to really automate our governance. So I, I just want to close out because I know we're at the top, uh, top of the 50 minute mark here um, and say like automated pipeline governance is about controlling, understanding and mitigating risk, right? And even though you can't do these things all at once, like snap your fingers, so you have everything, uh, we can get there uh, through increments. We can continuously improve. So I hope this session was really helpful in doing that. I'll stick around and answer any questions because I know we had a, a few more, but I, I really appreciate the time that you all, you all spent with me. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'm all over um, the social medias and you can find me wherever, but thank you all so much. Yes, thank you so much to Tiffany for her time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us as a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today, and we hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.